Okay. Welcome to our opportunity to come together and worship as the Yankee Church of Christ. We are blessed to have everybody here today. And uh, just a reminder uh, of the, the cards and the pews in front of you. If you are visiting or if there's something going on in your life you would like us to be praying about, take a moment, fill out one of these cards. You can... Uh, Drop it in the box on your way out as you exit. But we are, we're blessed to have you here to be able to worship together. And, and that's what we want to do. We have the opportunity to continue to invest in one another in that relationship that we all ought to desire with God. And, and we want to become that family that has that love for God, that we really want to invest in and help each other to become more of what he's calling us to be. And to, to as we invest in one another, to serve and find those opportunities for service as we know and, and we can meet the needs of one another. And then also to help other people who don't yet have that relationship with Christ to understand what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ. And then having obeyed the gospel to help them continue in that relationship and grow in it to become part of our family so that they also can do the same with their friends and their family as well. And that comes because we're trying to get in step with Christ. And we are blessed to have a father who loved us enough to give up his son to to came and to, to lead by example, to give us example that we can follow in. And so many of the, the men and women who were faithful, even in the first century, left us that example. So as we try to get back to where they were at, we will become more of what he's calling us to be. We're going to enter into our time of worship, and um, let's be attuned to the words that we say during the prayers, as we pray those prayers together and to also be attuned to the songs that we sing and the words that are presented to us this morning. Bow with me. Father, thank you for another Sunday where we can all be together and uh, learn your learn more about you and your word. Father, for uh, those who aren't able to join us uh, today, we pray for safe travels or uh, uh, healing for them. Um, Lord, may your may Rob's message in this worship service um, be pleasing to your ear, and may it provide us with um, spiritual bread for our week ahead of us. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and start with standing so we can wake up and stretch out. He be the Amen. Well. 
Scripture reading will be taken from Matthew 25, 14 through 18. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. The one he gave five bags of gold to the other two bags and the other one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. God. 
got thinking this week. What are we doing with what God has given us? And we talk about the notion of what it is to, to be a disciple and what that looks like for each one of us as we go through our lives. And God continues to richly bless us. Now, there'll be times when there is want and there's times when there's plenty. And it feels like sometimes we're on a roller coaster when it comes to the things that we have versus the things that we feel like we need in our life. But we understand that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, and he provides for each one of us so that we don't have to worry, we don't have to want. It doesn't mean that our lives are free from challenge. But I got thinking, you know, if we are going to live out the words, even the last song that we sang, is we've got to put God above everything. And the things that he gives us, he expects us to use to return the glory to him. Have your Bibles, you can turn over to Matthew, the 13th chapter, and this isn't on the slides, but Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46. We see that Jesus is trying to teach those who are with him, those disciples, the cost of what it looked like to, to follow after him. And as he's teaching out by the sea, he has the opportunity to present many parables to them. And one of those was a just a two-verse parable. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had. And he bought it. man goes to the seller and i can only imagine if jesus was the merchant at this particular store what the conversation would be like but in fact he is saying i have something very 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 valuable and i pray that you buy it from me. go up and said i want this pearl how much does it cost it's it's very expensive it costs quite a bit well i want to buy it how much is it as i said there's a big cost to it. It's pretty, pretty pricey. I think I can buy it. Well, I think you can buy it, but it's going to cost you everything. No more, no less. Anybody is available to purchase this particular pearl. You're willing to pay the price. I want it. All right, well, let's see what you have. What do you bring into the table to offer for this very valuable pearl? Well, in my bank account, I have a couple thousand dollars that I've saved up, and I, I'm, I'm willing to give that. Perfect. Let me jot that down. What else you got? That's it. I got a couple thousand dollars in the bank. What more would you want from me? Let me see. I've got, I got a couple hundred in my wallet. There you so. Okay. What else you got? Well, that's that's all the money I have. What do you have a house? Yeah, I, I have a house. Well, okay, I'll take that. What, so what, you want me to go live in the garage? Oh, you have a garage too. Well, let me jot that down. Do you have any cars in the garage? Well, I actually have two cars in the garage. You want my cars too? Yeah, I'll take those as well. But then I'm left with nothing. It's just me and my family. You have a family? Yeah, I have a wife and two kids. Oh, perfect, a wife and two kids. Let me jot that down as well. So let me get this. You want all of my money in the bank and in my wallet. You want my house. You want my garage. You want my cars. You even want my kids. I'm left all alone if you're taking everything I have. Oh, I didn't jot that one down. Your life as well. See, when it comes down to it, Christ is saying, I want everything you have. I want you all in. I want you to recognize that when we make that decision to become a disciple of his, that's exactly what we're doing. We're turning our lives and our will and everything we have over to him. And he says, you have to realize now that I am the owner of all of these things. And whenever I have need of them, all I need to do is say, I want that thing. Now, I'm going to let you use those things. And you can use those things as a demonstrator of your love for me to return the glory to me. Saying, yes, my master allows me to have these things. Why? Because he loves me and he loves every one of us. The opportunities we have every day to return the glory back to him. He said, look, I now own all of these things. You know, that's part of counting the cost that we often talk about when we're 
about to allow, we're, we're studying with somebody and they're about to make that decision to say, you know what, I want to be a disciple. We have to say, slow down for a second. You have to realize that there is a cost. A cost associated with making this decision because it will cost you everything. As we read through scripture, whether we read from the beginning of scripture to the end, there's something that we see time and again that occurs throughout the whole of scripture. And God says, when it comes to your life, I want to be not only the first, but I want to have what is rightly due me. I want to be in that place of preeminence, the first place in your life. And I want you to give me the first of everything. Even from when we see that Adam and Eve had kids, what was that they were sacrificing, Cain and Abel? It wasn't the junk that might have been left over. It might have been not the, the stuff that could have been toward the end of their crops, but he wanted the best. And that's exactly what they offered. And then from a short period after, he began to instruct his nation, the nation of Israel. He said, I want you to give me your first fruits. You can turn to, to Exodus. In Exodus, the 23rd chapter in the 16th verse, we see that as the Jews were about to celebrate the fact that they were able to work and had provision. And God said, I want the first of everything that you just put forth to do. At the festival of harvest, I want you to bring that to me. It's a recognition that the things that you have are not necessarily of your own doing, but you are blessed of me. And to remind yourself of where your blessings truly come from. And even a little further, uh, in that same chapter in Exodus 23 and verse 19, God asked for the best of the first fruits to come so that they can bring them to the house of the Lord. So many of the offerings that we see were prescribed in the law of Moses were to give the first. In Leviticus 2 and verse 14, they were to offer the, the grain offering of their first fruits. In Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 10, when they finally were able to come into the promised land, and as they came in, they were able to grab all of the, the, the produce that had been left behind, all of the livestock. And what did God say? I want you to take of the first fruits. I want you to give me what is rightly due to be reminded of where your blessings come from. And then in Numbers, Numbers 15, verses 20 to 21, they were supposed to give a loaf uh, from the loaves that they were going to make, a portion of that dough to the Lord. Why? Because it was the first. He didn't want the last. He didn't want, oh, there's this part that didn't really rise up well. He said, I want what is rightly due me, the good stuff in your life stuff that I have blessed you with. It wasn't always just about their food, the work of their hands. There was a time where he even commanded that they give their, their firstborn to the Lord. There was a time when they were building up the tribe of Levi. 22,000 were expected. So they were to give of their firstborn. And those that went over that number were to be redeemed to make a sacrifice in place of those extra that will be allowed to be returned to their families. Numbers 3 and 11 through 13. Time and again, God's people were to give of what they had been blessed with. And that's where we read the verse about stewardship. There was a man who went on a trip and he gave each one of his servants what he felt that they were capable of. One, five, and two, and one. What are we doing with what God is giving us? Are we holding back and not giving him our first? Are we kind of giving him, even when it comes to our time or talent or our treasure, stuff that's left over? And God wants the, the place in our hearts, in our lives. He wants to demonstrate that he is first in all that we have and all that we are. Nehemiah 10, verses 35 to 37. We see that, again, God's people had now come out of captivity. And they were trying to give God the first. And here we see that they agreed that I'm going to give whatever comes out of the ground, the first stuff, the best stuff that comes out, we're going to give that to God, whether it's the firstborn of our flocks or our house or whatever it is, we are going to give to the Lord. 
Solomon writing in Proverbs 3 and verse 19, he says, the wise are told to honor God with their first fruits, so their produce. Time and again throughout scripture, we see that we are to give God our first. And he wants it. So it's no doubt that when we come even into the New Testament, we see that God still wants that very same. There's a song that we sing. A song that, you know, we sometimes forget is straight from scripture. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What does he want us to do? He wants us to seek first the kingdom of God. Sometimes we get so worried about so many things in our lives. And in that discourse, Christ said, you know what? Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Because you know what? God will provide all of those things as we are seeking to things are going to be taken care of. Under the new covenant, we're blessed because we don't have to necessarily give away our firstborn or the first per se of all that we have. That does not negate the fact that he still wants us to put him in that place of preeminence in our life. Jesus said, as such, there are some folks who might miss that. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke, the ninth chapter. In Luke, the ninth chapter, looking at verses uh, 57, 62. They're going along the road. Someone said to them, I'll follow you wherever you go. Sometimes in our lives, we might make that pledge. Christ, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You might say that to God. God, if, if you help me out in this, I'll, I'll whatever you want, I'm with you. What was Christ? What did he respond to? He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But I'll follow you, but first permit me this. Let me go and bury my father. If you've ever studied this, it's probably that uh, acknowledged that his father wasn't even sick, may not even been dead. That I want to want to spend some time with him. Permit me to go do this thing. Now, he may have very well been dead and waiting to be placed in the ground, but the point is, he said, there is a time and a place, and right now I want you to follow me. We can begin to offer up excuses as well. But he said, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom everywhere. And another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go uh, say goodbye to those who are at home. And Jesus says, nobody, after putting his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. When we make a decision to follow him, we recognize it does come with a cost. As was pointed out a few weeks ago, for some, that cost is too great. And they say, you know what, I can't be a disciple if it's going to cost me this. If you have these high expectations, I was expecting you to kind of lower them for me personally, so I'm just going to come out. It happened in Christ's day. He saw people who liked what he had to say, but weren't willing to do what he had to say. And we can fall into that same category. There are things where, like, you know, there's certain things I like that you're saying, Jesus, but there's others. They're, they're just too hard for me, so... But unfortunately, our lives are not intended to be a cafeteria style or religion where we get to pick and choose. It is about fulfilling the whole will, doing what he's asking us across the board. We also know what he's asking us is not so heavy, such a burden that we're intended to be weighed down. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. What I'm asking you to do, you're able to stand under because I'm going to be right there beside you, helping to shoulder the load. But I need it. Do this with me. We're going to do it together. God wants our first. He wants our first thoughts, our first words, our first love. God wants you first. When we think of him first as we go through our life. It just becomes a natural part of who we are. That we're not only so connected to his word and his will, but it just comes forward in the way we talk to other people. The way we interact with other people. It becomes natural for us. 
to live according to his standard because we're putting him first in our lives. God wants the first, and we need to be willing to give it to us. Turn over to Paul's second letter to the, third, uh, the church of Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. Paul writes, and he, he lets us know that God made us first, and, and as such, we ought to be willing to, to live for him. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, but we always... Give thanks to God for you, brother, loved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in truth. That is, for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord, Jesus Christ. We are the first fruits. Time and again, we see throughout Scripture that that's what God's intention is, that we are right there with Christ as the first fruits. In Hebrews 12 and verse 23, it clarifies the point by saying that as members of Christ's church, we are those first fruits. Think about what that means. We understand what God wants for us. What he desires to be first, and he desires us as first fruits to rise up and fulfill what he desires. He doesn't just want our first efforts, he wants the first fruits. He doesn't simply just want our first works, he wants us to be all in. You know, the problem in our lives is there's some things that we put above God. That we want to have is the, the thing that's most important in our lives. We say, well, this is even more important to me than that relationship with God. We don't verbally say those words out loud, but our actions and the way we live our lives so often reflect that very same thing. It's not that we don't want God. It's not that we don't even want to be close to God. We allow other things to become the priority. Things that are not inherently wrong until we place them above God. Work, family, those hobbies, our money. But as we are choosing to become disciples, it means that we have to be willing to say, you know what, none of those things are wrong. But until I'm living for God, those things are never going to be at the right place in my life. We have to make some adjustments. For some, it means some major adjustments to recognize that maybe we're living for the wrong thing. Rather than to live for God and to bring those things under submission and to bring glory back to him, we're living for those things and, and the, such not allowing them to return any glory to God, even in the simple decisions that we're making. Think about what you're putting first your life. Story, you turn to Luke. In Luke, the 10th chapter, we have a familiar passage. The story of Mary and Martha. In Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. And as they're traveling along, Christ and his disciples, he entered a certain village and they a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home, she called her sister Mary, whoever was listening to the words, Lord, seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all the preparations, she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered by many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really only one thing and Mary has chosen the good part, and it will be not taken from her. We can get so distracted, so caught up in the cares of the world. And that's where Satan wants us, and that's where our own desires can lead us. But look, there's a lot of stuff that might be important. Actually, there's really only one, and that is, what are we giving our time to? I can remember it was years ago that Bob... Messer came and he had a large jar of ping pong balls and regulated the fact that our lives are 
like those ping pong balls. And we can begin to take out because we're giving so much time to, to work and so much time to play or, or video games or TV or in, all of a sudden we realize there's only a little bit of time that we have left. But if all the while we, we are giving our time to work while using that as an opportunity to return the glory to God, seeking the opportunity to share our faith with our co-workers and to help those who are, are, are struggling. If we're going through and taking the blinders off, but seeing there is so much opportunity to fulfill what we say is that, that we can encourage everybody to be a disciple, whether it's our neighbor who we might get frustrated with, but use that opportunity or the neighbor that we absolutely adore and love to share that opportunity, to invite them into our world, to our home, to the relationship with Christ. Because God's a priority in everything we do. So rather than just seeing it as work or school or now about using what we have been blessed with to turn the glory back to God. Martha said, you know what, I want to be attuned to making sure that you got everything you need. So much so that she didn't slow down and listen to Jesus. And I think sometimes in our lives, we can just be running around, just frantic, trying to do this, that, or the other while we're missing the boat. Mary kind of got it. She said, you know what? Sometimes I just got to slow down and I've got to listen to my Lord. I won't be taken from it. We get so frantic in our lives that we're not making God the priority. If we're not slowing down in our lives enough that we can say, God, what is it you're trying to accomplish through me? What does God want? It's a question we so often ask, but if we're so noisy and so busy that we never slow down to hear his voice in that whisper, or in the fact that there's something he wants us to do, we're just not making time. Not using the talents that he's giving us to return glory. Not using the treasures for hiding in the ground. I'll get around to it one day. I know you're hard, God, and you're going to come down an exact vengeance on those who don't. And I, I don't want to be on the bad side of that. So I didn't do anything with what you gave me. I pray that none of us are on that side. Think about what he says in Luke 9, verse 24. Verse 23 and 24, he says, If anybody wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross every day. Not just when it's convenient. Not just when other Christians are around, but you take up your cross every day and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who'll save it. We're making him the priority in our life. Much like the one who sought out that great pearl, recognizing it's going to cost him everything. Bank account, house, the possessions that he has, even the relationships that he has. And thus, we're willing to put God as the true number one in our lives. All those other things are not going to be seen as the blessing they are and used to return the glory to God, but rather they're going to be used for our own ends rather than to bring the glory to God. Now, we're trying to, to hang on to those things in our life, those parts of our lives that... Uh, you think are just too important but you know what you're going to lose because you're not making it a priority you know part of, of being disciples as we've been talking about that is that we've got to sometimes rethink the way that we're living out our lives we have to change it and Romans says we have to transform the way that we think we can't keep living according to the same pattern that we always thought was right but now we have to Start retraining our brain to do it God's way and to, to see through God's lens of how he would have us to live out our lives. You might think, Rob, I think God is, is asking a little too much. I can see that sometimes people might want to fall away. But you know what, Rob, I'm not willing to, to go in that direction. I'm not willing to truly give him because there's other things that right now at this juncture in my life. How many of you guys have ever been studying with somebody and they're not willing to make that decision because they said, well, right now I just want to do this with my life first and then I'll get around to. 
God may ask us to, to give ourselves to him, but he's already given himself to us. According to Romans 8 and verse 29, it says that Jesus was the, the firstborn. Romans 8 and verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God loved us so much that he committed himself to us, that whatever it took to redeem us, to get us back into that relationship, even if it meant his one and only son. And as such, he said, you know what? He's the first. He's the first to be redeemed, and all of us will then be redeemed in the grave. He took on the sins of the whole world so that we can have that relationship with God again. How much more will we ought to be willing to serve a God that loves us that much. To do it his way rather than our own or the world's. Put to death those things that can hold us back. We've got to be willing to give ourselves completely over to him. Making our lives about him. And it's not easy. And sometimes we need to remind each other that uh, we have to make some changes. Give each other an account. Say, so, you know what, I'm struggling in this area. I want some help in this area. But we don't do that because we sometimes try to lone ranger our faith and say, you know what, I don't want anybody to know that I might have weaknesses, I might have struggles. Let alone get into scripture to help each other, to allow the spirit to work as we go through those times to overcome. That's what this intention is. To, to become a family that loves God and is willing to do it his way rather than our way or the way the world is trying to dictate that means that we've got to serve one another. That means we've got to take some time out. And that's what we've been talking about when it comes to this notion of discipling. If our time is, oh, that's my time. I, I'm not picking on any of my kids, but some of my kids feel like they need my me time. This is me time right now. I get me time. I'm not picking on anyone, but they know who, because they're, they're probably red in the face right now. They need me time. I get that. But where's the God time? If God time is not all the time, then, you know, if we're only about, that and that's, that's not what it's saying it's saying look your time is God our time is limited I'm appreciating class the reminder of that this morning that you know what we're in that last day we used the example this morning in class if, if as parents you gave your kids say I'm going to be home at 5 o'clock and I need you to have something accomplished by then parents you ever say that I got to go out I'm running an errand by X, the, the certain time I'm coming home, this has to be done. Now, it might be that that child waits until 4.59 to try to do something, but you know at 5 o'clock, mom and dad are coming home, and you better have this done. Because if not, there's going to be punishment for it. We're living in the last days. Christ says, I'm coming back. But if we're living like, well, he'll come back in another 1,000 years. I got nothing to worry about. I got another 30 years of my tickers so i'm good to go in 30 years i'm going to get serious about my faith i'm hiding my talent and that talent is going to be taken from me and given to somebody who can successfully use it and bring glory back to god if we're not doing what he's calling us if we're not making him the priority in our lives there's coming a day where we're going to be eternally disappointed now, some of us are, are, are living for the right things. We're striving to move in that direction. We're trying to help disciple one another and our friends and our coworkers and our family. And I want to commend that we continue to do that, but even more so that for those who have not yet taken that step to say, you know what, I want to be serious about my faith and truly make him the priority in my life and giving him everything, recognizing it is not mine. It's his to return the glory back to him with. But you started living for the wrong things and you've forgotten what your life is supposed to be about. And you want some help getting back on track. You know, God loved us so much that he didn't leave us without a way back to him. That's why he gave us his son. And he's also given us the body to help one another out. You know, in a moment, we're going to sing a song to encourage because some of us might need that encouragement to say, you know what, I'm, I'm living for the wrong stuff. I'm going down the wrong track. There's sin in my life, and it's not just in my life. It's what I think about. Like right now, I can't wait till I leave service so that I can. We're headed down the wrong road. And I pray that you're willing to make some changes this very day to say, you know what, 
I don't want to keep going down the wrong road. I want to live for the right thing. I want to use what God's giving me and return the glory back to me. So that might mean that you're going to need some help overcoming, overcoming some sin that exists in your life. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you've never given your life over to him and said, you know what, I, I, I want to, to be eternally all in for him. But I don't know how to do that. And I want to study. And I want to encourage you right now. You guys can come to the front. You guys can go to the back. Or you can find somebody after church and pull them aside and say, I need some help, but don't wait till next week. Don't even wait till tomorrow. Make today the day where you say, you know what? I'm committed and I want to be committed. I want to be all in. I want to give him the first of everything I have and everything I am. If you have a need, why don't you come as we stand and sing this song to encourage your spirit. To Jesus I surrender all to hear my plea. Oh, uh-huh.
Good morning. As we prepare our minds to take the Lord's Supper today, I'd just like to take a few seconds or minutes to think about the emblems that we're taking this morning. The bread, which represents our Jesus Christ's broken body. The fruit of the vine, which represents the, his shed blood. All of this for us, so that we can have a hope of eternal life. As we are about to take of these emblems, if we would, try to clear everything out of your mind. Let's put our mind just upon the cross, on Jesus and everything that he's done for us. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the many blessings that you give us each and every day. We ask now, Father, that you would be with us as we partake of this bread, which represents your son's broken body. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer and your blessings upon this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask that we would take this in a manner that is pleasing unto you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning, church, and it's good to have you here all, be all together and on this beautiful day to worship God and sing songs of praises and to pray, to listen to his word. That first song we sang today, you remember that song? He leadeth me, he leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whatever I do, what, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. If you were thinking about the words of that song when we were singing it, then you started out this worship service thankful because he is leading us. He's leading us in so many ways. I was thinking about, um, about the lesson and how do we know if we're considering ourselves to be owners or, or stewards? And sometimes it's when we're asked for something, isn't it? How we respond to that ask, whether we're well ready to give of our time or give of our means. God, we pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to our hearts and let us see inside us so that we will understand where we stand with you and with your word and with the principles that you've taught us, even in this lesson and in these songs that we've sung today. Father, we pray that you will accept the worship that we have given you today. As we've sung words that say that we'll put you first and that you'll, we'll be led by you, Father. Convict us if those words were not true. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. And we do not truly follow you for the blessings, but we follow you because we know that your way is the right way. And we know that in the end, to be with you is the greatest blessing of all. And so we do follow you. And we do want you to lead us. And it's our prayer today that you will open our eyes to those areas where we will not be led. Confuse it. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the people, the words, the teaching, all these things that talk to us. The principles of this world, Father, the cause and effect, all these things which you put into place, Lord, to teach us and to lead us. And we thank you for those things, Father. You're truly the great teacher. Praise you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen. couple of announcements as we close our time together. Uh, tea Night Together will be meeting from 5 to 8 at the Rotor House, uh, and they've asked to bring drinks and dessert. Now, there's also something that's going to be happening at their particular tea and tea that was a bit of a surprise to most of the youth group, but uh, if you have not yet got to uh, uh, say, uh, we'll see you around to Hannah Rose, uh, you may want to give her a hug today because she is taking off to Lawrence. This will be her last service with us. It was kind of like, hey, I'm leaving. It's like, well, I thought you had a month, so uh, it was un and unexpected, but we want to send her with our, our richest blessings uh, that she will not only uh, uh, be able to stay connected, but will uh, be a huge impact to her family while she's down there. So uh, we're uh, doing a send off with her and, uh, you know, some of the games that we might uh, take her out with tomorrow. So an opportunity for some more, maybe not the baby food game. That was last time, but we uh, may do some other additional fun games uh, tomorrow. So may want to bring a change of clothes because you never know. Um, also, the Kitty Parade is coming up. Oh, and one other thing about TNTs, if you have not yet met with Carson or Caleb and you're thinking, hey, I do want to open up my house, uh, there is a, a sign up of, made available. Just let them know and we'll get your name on that. Uh, we do have a couple opportunities, especially in the month of August, uh, but time is uh, quickly getting away from us. So if you do want to host, uh, whether you just want to have the, a meal at your house or whether you have an idea of uh, something you would like to do with the youth group, let them know as soon as possible because those uh, it's slipping away and your time uh, might uh, slip you by on that one. Kitty Parade coming up um, in two weeks, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, it feels like it's been forever since we've had a Kitty Parade. Now we get to do it. So that means that we're going to be cooking hot dogs. We're going to be handing out popcorn and water, uh, as well as an opportunity. Uh, we're going to be using our, our restrooms. We're also an emergency shelter since the Nevlin Center is becoming whatever it's becoming. Uh, so an opportunity there. Wanting people inside, directing people to the bathrooms, as well as people cooking hot dogs and putting them together and handing them out. So 
uh, there is a sign-up made available. You can sign up online. You can talk to Ryla. We want to encourage you. It's a great way. I know that uh, the chamber is appreciative of what we're doing. So I uh, hope everybody will be attuned to that on July 8th. It's a Friday night. Um, and our time with June is, is closing down, but we can still use, uh, as always, some additional supplies for our, our food pantry uh, box outside. So uh, if you can uh, stay attuned to that, or if you want to give uh, Pat some money, that would also be appreciated. Uh, again, if you have a visitor card and you signed, or if there's a member who has a need, just uh, take it and put it in the box in the back on your way out. So not only can have a record of your visit, but whatever's going on that you might need prayers for. I have no birthdays this week, but I didn't get embarrassed Skylar last week. So we'll sing happy birthday to Skylar, who had a birthday yesterday, and sing happy birthday to Skylar if there are no more announcements. Okay, happy birthday to Skylar then. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Skylar. May God bless you. But I do want to make aware for the entirety of the congregation, especially to the teenagers, uh, the parents or guardians of our teens, uh, there's been a challenge presented by Carson. And um, he said that if uh, our teens can read through the New Testament uh, before the summer's end, that he will, in front of everybody, shave his hair off of his head. And you know, Carson loves his hair. To go bald is a big thing. So parents, read the Bible with your kids. Be sure they're reading it. Are you going to shave yours too? Did you change your mind? You're going to shave yours? Whoa, shave his hair and grow a mustache. So parents, be sure you're reading. If you need one of the cards, there's some in the foyer. We can get some additional ones, but be sure they've read through the New Testament. Encourage them, read through it with them. Uh, and it's not just for our teens. I'm encouraging everybody to get into God's word and try to read through in the next two months, the New Testament. So with that, you guys are dismissed.